have in your notes your outline called Five Essentials for Christian Maturity. And I've taught on these things before, but I really want to bring it all together today and, and, and next week and maybe one more week, I'm not sure, to really help you to see the importance of, of what we're trying to do as, as a body of Christ right now. And not only for here, but we already have other churches waiting for this material to be translated into French because they're sold uh, on this material too. And the goal of the next year is to give you some, some really some foundational truths and, and make it available for the larger church body. But see, we have this problem in, in, in our, the worldwide church, the universal church. We have this problem, and, and the problem is, is that when a person becomes a Christian, normally, you know, if you've been in church for any period of time, either... Either a, your pastor has told you or a member of your church has told you or maybe the person that led you to the Lord has told you that if you're going to grow as a Christian, there's certain things you have to do, right? You, to, lead, to, live, to live the Christian life, to be a good Christian, you've got to read your Bible, pray, go to church, tithe, memorize Scripture, serve, evangelize, and if you do all these fundamentals of the Christian faith and you live a good life, um, then you'll be a good Christian, and so we dump all these do's and don'ts onto the, the new, new believer in Christ. Now, all these things are good, but I see them as tools. And it'd be like giving a newborn baby a toolkit with, you know, with a screwdriver and a drill and a, maybe a saw. They're going to hurt themselves, right? <laughs> it's just. Or, or, or the same newborn baby. Welcome to the world. Just want you to know you're going to have to learn how to drive a car and pay taxes and, you know, and it, we would never do that to a newborn baby, but we do it to newborn Christians all the time. And we overwhelm them with a big list of do's and don'ts. And, and, and you know, it's just, it's, number one, it's not natural, but it, it tends to overwhelm people also. And it doesn't honor the natural growth process that a human being goes through. And so with most discipleship models, we have two major problems. The first problem is that almost all discipleship material is knowledge-focused rather than a, um, a relationship-focused. It's knowledge-focused. We tell people, come to Christ, and immediately after they come to Christ, we give them all this stuff to almost keep them away from Christ because we've gotten rid of the relationship and gone back to the knowledge, the do's and don'ts. Most discipleship material focuses on attaining biblical knowledge rather than developing biblical relationships. The second big problem we have in the church is that almost all discipleship material is product-oriented versus process-oriented. It focuses on a person learning a very few key skills to become productive. We want to get people productive as soon as possible, but we don't that, do that with babies, do we? We don't say, come on, start to produce. Well, they do produce one thing, but it's not really what we had in mind, is it? <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. See, there's a natural process for, for that, that honors the way God created us, the way that human develop create, uh, uh, works. There's a natural process for developing whole, healthy, growing people. And, and so our solution has to be to develop an intentional and a relational process of discipleship um, where we produce mature sons and daughters of God. Uh, and that process has to be, number one, biblical. It has to be judged by the biblical standard for Christian maturity. And, and the biblical standard for Christian maturity tends not to be what we've taught over the years. Do this, do this, do this, do this. You know, get the old outside of the cup clean. Jesus says, no, I'm more interested about the inside of the cup, right? Number two, it's got to be relational. It has to focus on, being, on developing healthy, mature people who can function relationally, right? We've got to learn how to be, as Eli Miller said last week, we've got to learn how to function relationally. So good discipleship material has to teach you, help you, give you skills so that you can function relationally. Number three, it's got to be natural. Uh, the pro, whatever process we develop has to honor the natural process of human development that God, that God wired us this way for a reason. And we have to honor that it, it, when we disciple people. Number four, it has to be practical. It, it has to be sensitive to the God-given needs of humankind at every step of the process. 
You know, and a lot, again, a lot of discipleship does not honor the fact that when you become a Christian, you still got a lot of stuff you got to deal with. And instead, we force them to get into this process that's all results oriented, and eventually they crash and burn. And then we say, you, you know, you fail, or you lose, or whatever. Well, it, we did it to them, right? We laid all this stuff on them before they're ready. So I want to give you a concept that I have taught over the years, but I'm going to really try to bring it all together this week and next week. The concept, see, Paul made a really, really interesting statement um, when he was communicating to the people in 1 Corinthians. He said in 1 Corinthians 15, 46, the spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. What Paul was saying is that every time God wants to teach us something, he gives us first a natural... um, Example. And from that natural example, then we can understand the spiritual. The reasons why a lot of people get messed up in the Bible is they try to understand the spiritual without understanding the natural. Okay? And, and, and therefore, we, they go off on some strange tangents or whatever. And, and so God always gives us a natural um, example to observe so on, on any topic so we can understand the spiritual. The bride of Christ. Well, first there's the natural bride and groom. Spiritual warfare. Well, first there's the natural human warfare, right? Whatever it is, there's a natural uh, example first. And so if we want to learn how to help new believers in Christ grow into mature Christians, we have to look at the natural example. And what is a natural example? The, the basic human process, how a person is born and how a person grows as a baby and into infancy and childhood and, and young adult and adult, and then apply spiritual principles and understand what the Bible does have to say spiritually based upon what we understand in the natural. So we're going to look at how a child grows naturally this morning and just look at the first three stages, okay? And then see what we can learn about growing as, as, as Christians in the spiritual. Okay, so the first step in the natural. A baby. What happens when... A, you know, I started thinking about this. What, when a baby is born... It comes into the world in the very first moments, and I'm talking the very, very first moments of life, they have to experience three different things in order to start growing healthy. The first thing they have to experience is that they're cut free from their mother's umbilical cord. It's got to happen. Like, what happened if they didn't do that? They'd be dragging around this thing. See, and even the human body knows how important that is so if you don't cut it off it's going to come out anyway right like like the placenta comes right out even though it's in the mother's womb for like nine months or whatever as soon as the baby's born it somehow just detaches like even the human body body's smarter than we are sometimes you know and, and so the first thing a baby this is gross first thing a baby <laughs> has to do you got to cut off you see that baby was get this that baby was living in a whole different environment they were, they were getting their life from a different source. They were getting their, 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 their blood was flowing, flowing from a different source. Their nerves were connected to a different source. That has to all be cut away so that baby can now be free to develop as a person. Second thing you do to a little baby is the doctors immediately take that baby and they check for internal obstructions. They look in the nose and make sure there's no blockages, either whether mucus or other things in there. They make sure that the nose is free and they'll even get the little suction thing go to get you know make sure it's free yeah too much information right <laughs> see i haven't eaten yet today so i'm fine <laughs> see? and and the second and they also check the mouth right and they make sure there's no blockages they get rid of all the upturn, internal uh, um, obstacles or hindrances so the baby can start breathing properly and the third thing they do is then they give it an initial wipe off right they don't take a hose to it right but they do do initial wipe off why do they do that so when, it's, when the baby's handed to the mother or to the other relative, it's not like, ooh, you know? There's an initial wipe-off just to remove some of the external offenses that would cause people to reject or react to that little baby, right? Because you don't want to pick up a gooey baby, right? You want it to be a little bit... <laughs> okay, moving on. Okay, so the exact same principles are true in the spiritual. And we mess up from the very first moment in the the church. 
Because when a person is born again, the very first thing they need is not to learn how to give and serve and worship. They need to have their past cut off. They need the umbilical cord to that other kingdom cut off. They used to live in another environment, the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of this world. They are tied to that. They've thought their, their life has come through that pro, from that kingdom that all needs to be cut off. And, and sadly, most Christians go through their whole lives never having had that umbilical cord to their old life cut off. And so 30 years later, or 40 years over, they are still walking in shame. They're still dealing with shame, uh, uh, um, uh, bitterness, resentment, uh, you know, all this stuff. Um, uh, I, I want to give an example, but I, I, it just been flogged to death, that example, that's all. Um, okay, there was a certain gentleman who started a ministry, became a Christian, started a ministry, and very successful. He led thousands and thousands of people to the Lord. He started up a TV ministry. He, it was just amazing how many people's lives were turned around under his ministry and that of his wife. But he never completely first cut off the past. And see, when he was young, both him and his wife grew up in very uh, uh, poor homes. Okay, A lot of poverty. And so even though they were now Christians and they trusted God, they were scared to death to ever go back to that poverty. And so they had to have lots of money around them. And so even though their ministry was reaching the whole world and they were successful in terms of ministry, they were always pulling money and buying themselves really expensive clothes and really expensive houses and goes on and on and on. And eventually um, they were caught for embezzling funds from the ministry and the guy ended up in jail. Okay. I'm trying, I don't want to give the name because the guy's had a change in his life. He's a wonderful man of God now and he's bringing healing to the body of Christ. But what happened? Was he anointed? Yes. Was he called of God? Yes. Did he have a successful ministry? Yes. But he crashed and burned because he never cut off the umbilical cord completely to the past. And he lived his whole life with that secret fear of going back into poverty. See, we've got to deal with the past. The second thing that happens when we become a Christian, we've got to get the internal hindrances removed. What are those internal hindrances? Not, not the mouth and the, and the nose. The internal hindrances are things like... Actually, let me... Uh, yeah, I'll go back to that. Hindrances like unconfessed sin, um, unforgiveness, shame, guilt, unreconciled relationships. Going back to the first point, being cut free, Psalm 129, verse 4, but the Lord is righteous. He has cut me free from the cords of the wicked. And that wicked included some of the stuff you were into in the past. He wants to cut you free. But point two, we need our internal, internal hindrances removed. Why? So that we can receive the full breath of the Holy Spirit functioning in our lives. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Let us throw off everything that hinders. Let us throw off everything that hindrances and the sin that so easily entangles. Those hindrances from the past, the shame, the guilt... It'll come back on you if you don't remove those hindrances. And eventually, whether it happens now or five years from now or ten years from now or twenty years from now, you will crash and burn. It, and it doesn't have to happen. No matter how well you got your life together, if you haven't dealt with those hindrances, they'll come back on you eventually. Those secret insecurities, whatever they are. Third thing, as I said, happens, you have to have some of the external offenses uh, cleansed. It doesn't mean their whole life is suddenly completely well put together, but there's just some obvious stuff that needs to come off when you first become a Christian. You know, the goo that the baby has. Some of the, you know, not to clean you up so you're perfect, but there's some, just some initial stuff. For example, how to deal with conflict in a biblical way so that when conflict comes, you don't start calling people names or swearing at them or losing your cool and have a tent or tent. tent. Like those are just offensive reactions to conflict. There are better ways. Teaching you how to forgive, you know, instead of taking everything as an offense. 
folks, it is so frustrating to try working with somebody that just constantly just gets offended at anything. We, we know that, right? At work, wherever. You, you've had this happen to you. You've seen, and, and it's like, oh, I'm so upset because you forgot to say hello to me this morning. Well, yeah, I was, <laughs> you know, whatever. You know, you, you, like, come on. Let's learn how to deal with those insecurities. You know, um, teaching people or helping people how to consider others and not just be me-centered, to be self-centered. Again, that's an offensive thing that, that just breaks relationships. What are we trying to do in the initial cleansing of a new Christian? We're not trying to make you perfect, but just get help you enough that you can actually have healthy relationships. And you can't have healthy relationships if you're offended at everything everybody does. Or, or you go on pity party uh, trips all the time. Or, or you run out of the room every time you feel tense. It's hard to have a conversation with someone that's running in another room. You know, it's just... It just it doesn't work, right? Uh, how to deal with your anger. There's a big one. Let's help you to deal with your anger so you're not blowing up over every little thing. Just wiping off some of the goo. That's, we're newborn babes. Let's help people get some of the goo off. Okay? Teaching them how to make amends with others. If they owe somebody something, pay it back, right? Just basic goo Removal, right? Okay. <laughs> offensiveness cleanse. Some of the initial external offensiveness cleanse. Psalm 139, verse 24. God says, pray, try praying this prayer. See if there, any, if there is any offensive way in me. You know, that's something we should teach. When I became a Christian, see, back when, when I first became a Christian, we actually sang this as part of a song. Though I learned that the very first week as a Christian, that we sang that song about, Lord, see if there's any offensive... It's an old hymn, right? Search me, O God, and, and try my heart, I pray. I can't remember. See if there be any wicked way in me. Search me, O God. Oh, forget it. Anyway, <laughs> I'm not... <laughs> I don't want to offend you with my singing. <laughs> so, just... There's some... When I was a Christian, I was praying that every day. That became my favorite hymn. Lord, search me. Is there any offensive way in me today? Now, I'm sure Pastor Kathy would say, hey, start singing that again, you know, <laughs> just, <laughs> just in case. Okay, so those, the first step, if we're going to be, grow as healthy Christians, the first step, and do I believe in tithing? I sure do. Do I believe in serving? I sure do. Do I believe in, in regular church tents? I sure do. But the first step is not any of those things. The first step is cut off the past. Get rid of the internal obstructions and deal with some of the goo in our lives so that we can at least have healthy, growing relationships, okay? And, and this will surprise you, but we just happen to have, starting October the 11th, an eight-week course to help you do that. If you've never taken Life's Healing Choices, we've heard such great testimonies. We've already gone through this course twice. Uh, we present it twice, and just the testimonies are amazing. October the 11th. Um, Tuesday nights, eight weeks, to help you cut off the umbilical cord, get rid of the obstructions, and help you get rid of some of the goo. Okay. After a baby has those three initial things done, and I'm talking the very first moments of life, what happens next? Then they wrap the baby in a blanket, give it some sense of warmth and comfort and security, and they give it to the mother. Always, never to the father, to the mother. Why is that? Well, because they feel bad for the mother because she's done the most work. Maybe, I don't know. The, do you know the real reason? Because everyone knows that baby needs to be bonded to their mother. So they immediately put the, the baby on the mother's breast. Okay. If a, if, a, if a natural child is going to live a healthy life, they have to bond with their mother. Okay? They may not know who they well, they don't know who they are as a person yet, but at least they're getting to know who mummy is and that mummy loves them and that mummy has embraced them. What do they learn when they're bonding with their mother? What do they learn? Well, number one, they learn about a mother's love. They're, they learn how to look deeply into their mother's face. You ever see that little baby's lying there in their mother's and look, looking, just looking in their mother's face? What, and when you look at what, what's going on, there's this love thing going on. It's communicating I love you, I love you, I accept you, you know. You're mine. And they feel their mother's 
love through that embrace and through looking in their mother's face. Second thing that happens, they learn about their mother's nearness. They learn how to call out to their mother, know that mummy's always there. In, in the early, early days, it's just wah, but later on it's like mummy, right? Because they're knowing that mummy hears them, is always close enough that they will always hear their cry. Okay, that's part of bonding. Third thing they learn is the mother's voice. They start to hear the mother's voice. And they get to know the mother's voice so that, that if the, again, if their mother is calling, they can, you, know, ever, you ever go into a, a, a crowded mall? And in that crowded mall, you have this little kid wandering away. There's this amazing dynamic. That mother, in a, in a crowded mall of thousands of people, if a little child calls out, calls out mummy, they'll pick, tune in to that mummy voice, right? They know. But the same thing, when the mother's calling, that little baby immediately knows which one of those thousands of mummies all calling out for their children in the mall, which one is their mother's voice? Okay, that's all part of bonding, to hear and recognize the voice of the mother. And the fourth thing is they learn about their mother's protection. Their mother's going to hold them secure and safe in their arms. They learn about security and safety. And so that baby, if it's bonded with its mother, it gets a healthy sense of being loved, a healthy sense of being accepted, of, of being secure, of being safe, of being valued. All those things are part of the bonding process that happens when a baby is born, okay, as a little, that little infant now. Well, again, the same should be true in the spiritual. The, the, the second thing that every believer needs after some of that cutting off of the past is a need to be bonded with the maternal side of their Heavenly Father. See, because God has both sides to him, right? He has the maternal side and the paternal side of Heavenly Father. And they need to be bonded. Every Christian needs to be bonded to the maternal side of their Heavenly Father to know his love, to know his acceptance, to know that he's there for them, to know his voice. See, in John 17, Jesus gives us the fundamental reality of the Christian life. This is the core reality of the Christian life. If you want to know what the Christian life is truly all about, it's right here in John 17, verse 3. Jesus said, this is eternal life. And it's not the Ten Commandments, and it's not going to heaven. This is eternal life that they may know you. Jesus said eternal life is knowing the Father the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Eternal life is not about going to heaven and living forever. We got it wrong. Eternal life is primarily about the incredible privilege of intimately and personally knowing God. That's eternal life. When you know God, everything else, just, it just, it's just there. You start with that reality, I need to know God. The incredible privilege of knowing Him intimately here and now on the earth. Okay? God, God, eternal life is not a destination, okay? Eternal life is a process of getting to know our Heavenly Father. That's what eternal life is. That's why Jesus said, if you have the Son, you have life. But now let's grow in that life. Let's learn how to really embrace eternal life. You do that by embracing the Father. Paul put it this way, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of sharing his sufferings, and, and becoming like him in his death. What was, was he saying? I want to know Christ in every way possible. I want to know him in every aspect of his being. I want to become intimate with him, to know him. And as we do that, what happens? We become bonded with our Father. We learn about the Father's love. Just as we learn about the mother's love, when we bond, we need to bond with the Father. We get to know His love. To learn how to gaze into His face. That's what the Bible says. Psalm 27, verse 8. My heart says of you, seek His face. Your face, Lord, will I seek. What's that all about? Gazing into the face of our Father that we can see His love for us. To be totally convinced that God loves me. And not Jesus loves me, this I know because the Bible tells me so, but he loves me because of that, but he also loves me because I've learned how to gaze into his face. And I have this, this, this uh, gazing into his face that I know he loves me. Second thing, the Father's nearness. 
John 14, verse 70, You know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. That was before Jesus rose from the dead. Now he's risen, he's with you and in you. We know to know his fa- Father is near us, not only here, but he's here by his Spirit. Part of bonding with the Lord is to know I have the fullness of the Holy Spirit dwelling in me, and God is always with me. He will never leave me or forsake me. The third part of bonding with the Father is knowing the Father's voice. John 10, verse 27. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. Who does God know? Those that listen to his voice. When we get to know the fa- Father God, we, get to know his, we, we, we will start to be sensitive to his voice. We'll be able to pick his voice. So we'll know which is his voice, which is our own internal voice, which is the voice of Satan. We'll get to know because we spent time bonding with the Father and we will be able to pick his voice out in the crowd of all those other voices trying to come into our head. And we'll enjoy the amazing benefits of his wisdom and his guidance. See, intimacy is about learning the, about the voice of God. And the fourth thing, there's the Father's protection. Just like we had the Mother's protection in bonding, there's the Father's protection. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, according to his power, that's at work in us. See, if we understand, if we get, as we get to know him, we know his power is here, and therefore we have his protection. We have his protection. See, see the power of God working in us isn't just about signs and wonders. It's also about power management manifested in guidance, in correction when we're going to do something silly, in revelation. His power manifested in peace when we're anxious or worried. You know, all those things. It's, uh, his power manifested in strength. His power manifested in security. So when we bond with the Lord, we suddenly realize that He is with us and here to protect us. And we don't have to be afraid anymore. We, we, we were saying that this morning. Because I know he's with me. I will not be afraid. See, if you're afraid, perhaps you've never really bonded with that side of God. See, because perfect love, the Bible says, casts out all fear. And the way to have perfect love is to embrace imperfect love. And the way to embrace perfect love is to bond with the, that maternal side of God that gives us that sense of security and safety and love and acceptance and all those things. Well, and it just so happens <laughs> we're doing an eight-week course on that to help you bond with Father God starting October 12th for eight weeks and in those eight weeks we're going to teach you the incredible love that father god has for you and how to actually receive it into your life in every aspect of your life okay and San- pastor sandy's working on this curriculum right now who will be in faith ready by october 12th <laughs> okay so i'm telling you where we need to go and i'm saying we're on our way and we, we're going to give you er- i'm not just going to I'm not one of those guys that gets up and says, you should do this and you should do this, and when you get home you realize you don't have a clue how. We're telling you what you need to do, and we're telling you we're going to help you. Okay? First step, cut off that umbilical cord. Then what we do, we bond with the maternal side of the Father. But then there's a third thing. What's the third thing? Well, what happens in a natural child? The third thing every natural child has to accomplish is to become self-aware, to know who they are. Yes, I know mommy and daddy now. I bonded with mommy and daddy, but who am I? Right? Who am I? It's one thing to know mommy and daddy, but who am I? They have to become self-aware. They get to know, they start learning about their strengths and their weaknesses. They start learning about what they're good at and what they're not good at. They, they're starting to know that who they are. I am, a chi- I am a son of this person or I'm a daughter of this person and this person. These are my brothers and sisters. They're starting to learn about their identity. Okay? They're becoming self-aware. They start to develop a sense of identity and purpose. Okay? Now here's the thing. Science has told us or shown us um, that although a child's sense of security and safety and love is developed through relationship with their mother, a child's identity and purpose and vision and confidence and courage are developed through a relationship with their father. And so every child needs to bond with their mother, but they also need to bond either with their father or with a stepfather or a father figure. And that's why, uh, um, 
what's it called? Big Brothers is so, so, so important. Okay? Every child needs to then be called up in their identity through a man. Why is it that Quebec has so many purposeless young men? Why is it that we have, what, a 35% dropout rate or more in our high schools? Because there's no man to call up those boys. And they have no purpose, no destiny, or no sense of destiny, no direction, no, no courage in their lives. We, we could go a lot more there, but basically that's the core thing. So look, look, at, the, look at the spiritual well, the third thing, after a child has cut, like a baby, a spiritual babe has cut off that umbilical cord to the past, and then they've been bonded to the maternal side of the father, then they must bond with the paternal side of the father. They must start relating to the, to the fatherly father side of the father, okay? Um, to get to know the, the strong, fatherly, power, powerful side of their heavenly father, and when they do so, they get to get a clear sense that, yes, I am a son of God, or I am a daughter of God, and I'm confident because Father God is behind me. And they get to experience all the wonderful benefits of a clear sense of identity. And I've listed your, the benefits there. Identity, when we, when we know our, our identity in Christ, it gives us a sense of acceptance. Romans 9, 25 and 26. He says, as he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people. I will call her my loved one who was not my loved one. And it will happen in that very place where it was said of, to them, you are not my people. They will be called sons of the living God. God said, if, if these people are going to be whole, they have to know that I'm calling them. I'm accepting them. They're my sons and daughters. He, he, he's saying, I'm calling identity into them. Number two, identity gives us a sense of belonging. 2 Corinthians 6.18 I will be a father to you. You will be my sons and daughters. A sense of belonging. I'm no longer alone. He's my father. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a son or daughter. That means there's other kids too. I have a sense of identity in the family. I have brothers and sisters in the family. I'm, I'm no longer... I don't know... I used to not know who I am, but now I know. I, I know who my brothers and sisters are. I know who my, my father is in, in the spirit. Gives us a sense of belonging. I can go anywhere in the world now, and suddenly I meet a Christian. I go, "Oh, family!" I have identity instantly. I'm part of a family. I belong. As we develop this identity and who our father is, we also start to understand who our brothers and sisters are. We, we have a family. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, uh, Therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are now fellow citizens with the saints, and you are members of the household of God. You are members of the household. You know, I, I used to wonder why some people just never seem to be able to connect with a local church, with a local family of God, until I discovered that in most cases, because they never really connected with God as their father. And if you don't know who God is as your fa father, you won't realize you have a family. You won't realize that there are other brothers and sisters that are here to, that love you and help you and support you. When we, when we truly know who we are, we suddenly are able or, to be aware of our spiritual family in Christ. Another thing identity gives us is a sense of being pleasing to God. There's something about when you know that you're a son of God, suddenly there's just this burden lifts off your shoulders and go, God loves me. He accepts me. I'm pleasing to Him. How, why, is that, why does that happen? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. He predestined, I to be, predestined us to be adopted as His sons through, Christ Jesus, or through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure. In accordance with His pleasure. It pleased God to draw us to Him. It pleased God to to adopt us as sons and daughters. And, and because it gave him pleasure when, when, you, when you responded to his drawing to him, when you responded and said, yes, Lord, I will give my life to you, I will turn away my, from my old ways, the, you know, I repent of my sins, I'll turn to you, and you draw to him, because it pleased him to draw you, you immediately start to feel his pleasure. And so as you're walking down the road and, and you're doing your thing as a Christian, somehow you just feel this 
wow, God's happy with me. I don't even know why, but I feel the pleasure of God in my life. Why is that? Because it's his pleasure that drew you. He is pleased. Every time you respond, there's pleasure. You give God pleasure. And you start to feel that. You can walk every day knowing, just because I'm a son or daughter of God, just because I responded to him, I can now have the daily sense of God's pleasure in my life. It doesn't mean you can't blow it and you feel God, you can grieve God's heart, but you don't have to live in guilt and shame and remorse for years and years and years. You can just say, God, I blew it. Please forgive me. You turn back to him, and what's there? Right away, waiting for you, his pleasure. And right away, you feel that reconnection with him. Number four, identity gives us a sense of provision. Of provision. Romans eight seventeen. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. See, when we suddenly real, when we truly understand that God is our Father, then we say, you know what? If, if, if the most powerful being in the whole universe is my Father, and He loves me, then He's probably going to look after me. He's probably concerned about my needs. He, he cares for my struggles. He wants to provide for me like any good, healthy father does. First the natural, then the spiritual. See, when we think of ourselves only as servants of God, slaves of God, we will struggle through life trying to get by, trying to do things on our own, trying to do our best to just survive every day. But when we really discover our true identity in Christ, we suddenly have this new confidence that God will give us whatever we need. Yes, in his timing, but he will give us whatever we need as his children. So we can have life abundant. We can start to live that abundant life. As his children, we have an inheritance in the Father. Galatians chapter 4, verse 5 that we might receive the full rights of sons. Rights? The full rights of sons. When you become a child of God, you actually have some rights. And you can appeal to God on the basis of those rights. Father, my God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Last time I looked, glory is a pretty amazing place. He cares. He knows the number of hairs on our head. The Bible even says he counts our tears and stores them up in jars. They're so precious to him. Like, he wants to provide for us. So when we know our identity in Christ, there's this sense of provision. Matthew seven eleven. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, how much more, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? To those who ask him. Try asking. You have not because you ask not. Ask. Why? That his joy would be full. And your joy also, obviously. <laughs> anyway, um, when we realize our true identity in Christ, we suddenly realize we don't have to beg God for anything. See, if my children were to beg me for anything, I would feel like a failure. That they would feel they would need to get on their knees and beg me. I would feel I've somehow been a failure. I haven't somehow presented my love for them properly or I somehow haven't presented uh, God's love for them properly. We don't have to beg. God loves us. He wants to provide for us. And so, when we realize we're son or daughter of God, we, don't have to, we know we don't have to beg. God wants to provide. So we just come boldly before the throne of grace, the Bible says, and we just ask, knowing that if it's good for us, and God is all wise, right? So he knows if it's good for us at this point. If he withhold it, there's a really, really good reason. Just in the same way when daddy or mummy withhold something for their child. Like, I'm eight years old now, can I drive the car? You know, no, we're going to withhold that for you for a little while. Why? <laughs> You'll find out when you're 16, right? Or whatever, you know. Can I use that saw? No, not yet. There's a reason. See, Because we love our children. And when you understand that you are a child of God, you know that you don't have to beg. You never have to beg for God. He will give you whatever you need. We don't have to beg. We don't have to plead. We don't have to manipulate. We don't have to jump through hoops. We don't have to perform. 
we receive good things from our Heavenly Father just by asking. Identity also gives us a sense of freedom. Romans 8.21 says that we're brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. When you truly know who your Father is, you feel free. You, you have this sense of freedom. Because you're no longer trying to be anyone else. What, God really accepts me just the way He made me? Like, didn't He make a mess when He made me? Didn't He somehow mess up? No, He made you the way you are for a reason. And God accepts me in that. God made me the way He did, and He loves me just as I am. Yes. And I don't have to try to be anybody else. I don't have to be, try to be my brother or my sister. I also don't have to, be, I don't try, have to try to be Pastor Debbie, or I don't have to try to be Sandy. I don't have to buy, try to be Sylvia. I don't have to try to be... You know, whoever, Joe, Wim, any. We don't have to try to be anybody else. No. I'm free to be me. Turn to somebody and say that. I'm free to be me. Free to be. Okay, now, now when you say that, the other person, keep a smile. Don't go, <gasps> you know, don't look like you're, you're like, it's like, no, that's not a scary thought. It really isn't. I'm free to be me. And that gives God pleasure. And there's freedom in that. We don't have to try to live up to anybody else's expectations. We don't have to try, you know, about how we should live, how should we act, what we should do. Instead, we're free to be who God created us to be. Because God made us the way we are. Yeah, we're free to be me. That that's so liberating. Who is I was watching Alyssa and I are having a bonding daddy daughter moment yesterday we're watching uh what's it called uh print thank you kelly princess diaries and there's a point when the uh the servant driver guy whatever he is he says oh gee, I'm, i, I should have written this down uh, he ba- he said something to the effect that no one can make you feel bad about yourself unless you give them permission wow <laughs> it's, it's like, but it's a secular movie. It's a Disney movie. <laughs> but there's truth in that statement. No one can make you feel bad about yourself unless you give them permission. If you know you're a child of God, a son or daughter of God, then you're not going to give anybody permission to make you feel inadequate, in, you know, undeserving, whatever. You are a child of God. Finally, 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 identity gives us a sense of being con- unconditionally loved. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us. One of the translations says He's poured it out like water in this big vessel full of water and He just pours it on top of our heads. How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us that we would know that we are children of God. And then He goes on and says, And that's what we are! Like, just to make sure we get it. We are children of God. See, when we understand that we're sons and daughters of God, that we're children of God, and we're, that we're free to walk in that love. We're free to receive that love. Uh, and we discover that um, we aren't loved because we do well. We aren't loved because we never fail or because we perform up to a certain standard. We're loved simply because we're God's sons and daughters. He didn't have to embrace us and accept us, but he did, and it caused him pleasure to do so. When we truly know that we're God's children, we can fully expect to receive His love simply because He's our Father. I try to communicate this to my own kids. I don't know if they always get it. I don't know if I always communicate it that well, but I will always love you. you know, just because you're my kids. No matter what happens. It may not always please me, but I always love you. <laughs> And, and, and there's no pressure to perform for that love in God. They, they, you know, it is, when you realize you don't have to perform to, to receive God's love, it makes it a lot easier to receive. Because it's not, oh, God, did I do enough today to get your love? No, it's like, God, I just receive your love right now. I need, I need that tangible sense of your love. Thank you so much. And then because you already have his love, it's a lot more motivational. To, it's a lot more motivating to want to please him because you already have you know, it's like, it's like it's like someone says, "Well, I'll give you a thousand dollars if you do this and this for me." And you go, "Man, like, that's a lot of work and and, and uh, kind of busy and all this stuff." But if someone says, "You know what? Here's a thousand dollars. If you could, could you do this for me?" 
you go, you like, you go, wow, this guy was so nice. Now you want to do it to please him because he's already blessed you. You know, like there's a whole, di- there's a whole different motivation. One is to earn something; the other is a response to something that was freely given. Okay, and everybody knows that love has to be freely given to be real. If love is earned, it's not real love. If love is demanded, it's not real love. Right? So, what have we learned so far today? We've learned the first three steps. Actually, let me say this one last thing before we go into that. Well, I, bleh, I'll put it all together. Okay. First three essential steps in the natural and in the spiritual. First is new life cutting off the umbilical cord. In the spiritual, it's new life breaking off my past. Second step is intimacy, bonding with the maternal side of Heavenly Father. Embracing my Father's love that I'm secure, I'm safe, I'm, I, I'm, I know I'm accepted. And the third, the third step is after we are really secure in our Father's love, then we can move on to the next step, identity. Because identity comes out of intimacy. We don't have time to address that today. But I, the third step, whether it's in the natural or the spiritual, is we've got to learn our identity, discovering my new identity in Christ, that I have a purpose uh, in my life. God has a plan for me. I'm a son of God. I'm accepted by, by Father. He's calling me up to great things. There's greatness in, in, in my life because God's called me those things. Therefore, there's purpose. And as I connect with purpose, God will provide for me all the resources, all the direction, all the provision that I need to fulfill his call in my life. And it's going to be a fulfilling, abundant, joyful journey as we do that. As I said before, the problem with our society is that Many of our young men, growing up, have bonded with their mother. They, but what happens? A baby is born into the world. We immediately put him into daycare, which is now 100% women just about. Guys are scared to death to ever work in daycare because of all the lawsuits. Okay? Then you go to primary school, which is 95% women. Then you go to high school, which is 75% women. Then they graduate, and you say, graduation is now be a man. Right? Why do our boys don't have a clue? Especially if they don't have a father in their life. Actually, the only salvation to our our young boys today is to have fathers in their life. And so what happens is 60, what is it? Only 60, 66, 67% of of, 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 uh, Quebec boys actually get through high school. Because they have no, see, they bonded with their mom. They have that feeling that I'm, you know, like, but they have no sense of direction, of purpose, of destiny. And so they give up. They give up before they can get through high school. Here's my concern. I am so convinced that the message for Quebec is the Father's love. We have so many orphan mentality type people in Quebec. They need to know the Father's love, that they're accepted, that they're loved, that God loves them just as they are, that he, has a, you know, just, he wants them to be secure and safe. But the, my concern is, if that's the only message we preach, that every Sunday, week after week, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you, but we don't get them to connect with the fatherly side of God, the paternal side of God, that says, step up, young man. I'm calling you higher. God's got a purpose for your life. God's got a calling on your life. God's got a destiny for your life. You need to start to make some sacrifices and choices because God has an amazing plan for your life. But you've got to step up. Okay? Um, We're singing lots of songs about God loves us and I I love them. But we've also got to learn how to, in the church, go beyond the Father's maternal side and to the Father's paternal side and start to call these young men up. And that... See, it's it's like when a little... when, when, When a little boy or girl, tries to ride a bike for the first time, what's going to happen? They're going to fall. They're going to scrape their knee. You, you, like, we've all done it, right? What happens? Mommy comes running in. Oh, you poor little baby. Let me wipe you off. Let me clean you up. Oh, no, this is terrible. Don't you ever ride again. This is so... Da-. Dad comes along and says, What are you doing on the ground? Get up. Come on, ride again. Like, Come on, it's only blood. Come on, get up. Ride it. Get up right now. Get back on that bike. Let's go for it. If all we had was that motherly influence, all our children would be scared to death to do anything 
because they'd be mothered to death as soon as they, as, as they hurt themselves. It requires the fatherly spirit also. You know, and I know some single parents, they have to step into both those roles and try to present the motherly and fatherly side. But that's hard, isn't it? And then their kids are confused because they're afraid to come to us. Because you know, If I go to my mom today, am I going to get mommy or am I going to get daddy? <laughs> right? It's just reality. So all I'm saying is that that's why there's a course three coming in, in February on how to walk then into our identity. And then there's a course four on how to start using our spiritual authority we're going to talk about next week. Okay? So I, I love the Father's Love message. But folks, as a church, as the church, we're going to have to start to call people up. We're going to have to demonstrate the fatherly side of God also, that paternal side of God. Or we're going to have a lot of young people that know they're loved, but, are ne- but have no sense of direction, no purpose, no destiny. We're going to have an aimless society. Okay? Let's stand to our feet. That was a downer, wasn't it, Dan? <laughs> okay. We'll continue on next week. If, if you've never accepted the Lord, this is a great Sunday to do it. Because God's presence is here to draw you in. You've heard that when you come to Him, he, it's His pleasure to draw you. And if you're feeling a tug in your heart today, it's because God's drawing you and He's pleased to do so. But you've got to do something. You've got to actually say yes to Jesus Christ. Yes, I want you to be my Lord and Savior today. Yes, I want to repent of my, my sins, that old system I lived in, I need to have that umbilical cord cut so that I'm free to live the new life. I just want to pray shortly for you, just a short prayer for you, and then we'll close. Father, in Jesus' name, if there's anyone today that, God, you're tugging at their heart today, Father, I pray right now that they would respond, that they wouldn't waste another moment struggling with guilt, shame, resentment, all these things that that old life brings. Just right now, just make... Make, make that statement to God. God, Jesus, I come to you today. I give myself to you freely. I ask you to forgive my sins. I ask you to receive me now and make me into a son or a daughter of God. Change my life. I give my life to you today. And I believe it's going to be an amazing life ahead as I now serve you. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that prayer, please do talk to me before the service is over and let me know you've made a decision for Christ. But Father, I also pray for us, uh, the believers in this room, and if they've prayed the prayer, now they're a believer too. Father, I pray that you would help us to cut off the past. God, that we would make the commitment. Find, you know, God, yes, we pray all the time. God, please help me. Please get rid of all my problems. Please set me free. But God, we're realizing it takes commitment to be free. Someone has to help us cut the umbilical cord. Someone has to help check for obstruction. Someone's got to do some of the wiping to get the goo off. Father, help us to make the commitment that if we've never gone through the life stealing Choices course, that we will commit to it and sign up for it, God, because we want to be cut free so that we're free to live the new life. And Father, for those that have done that, but they've never really bonded with you and, and, and they don't really know your love, Father, would they make the choice today to say, yes, I will take that course in how to embrace your love and receive your love and live the rest of my life in the security and the safety of that love. Father, we're here today because we're serious about our Christian lives. Lord, now help us to make the commitment that is necessary that we really can be free and that we really can walk in maturity. Lord, I bless each person here today. And Lord, I pray that as we develop these courses, that they, there will be a commitment level. Lord, that a year from now, we'll be able to look back and say, I have been on the ride of my life and I am free now to fully serve my God and to have life more abundantly. We pray those things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.